the king of my heart hey, the mountain where I run The fountain I drink from Always more so And let the king of my heart Be the shadow where I hide The ransom for my life Always more so Yes, you are
seat if you want. Uh, great to see you. It's June. Who's expecting that, right? It snuck up on me. I don't know about you guys, but welcome to summer. I uh, hope it, it, it looks a lot like summer outside today, doesn't it? <laughs> no, it's good. We probably need a little rain. Thank God for that. It's been a beautiful week. It's good to see your beautiful faces here. I'm Mike. I'm one of the ministers on staff here. If you don't know me already, I'd love to get a chance to do that. One way we can do that is having you fill out this card. If you're a guest, uh, fill this out. And there's boxes around the room uh, that have little crosses on it. My brother, Brian Kirschner, right over there, made these fine boxes. Uh, but take advantage of those. Fill this out. Put a little information on them. Drop it in there. Uh, and uh, we'd love to send you a gift card just as a way of thanking you and uh, for, for joining us uh, here today. You can also use those to put your offering uh, in those, uh, or you can do that online uh, or the old-fashioned way, send it in by check. Uh, but uh, we're going to take communion here in just a bit. And so if you haven't already uh, gotten some of the elements for that, just go to the same place and get those right now. If I'm not doing that on stage, I'm usually going to get it right about now. So I always forget mine on the way in, uh, but feel free to do that. I uh, hope you guys are having a good uh, summer following, you know, unofficial summer after the Memorial Day weekend, and hope you had a good time. Uh, we have lots going on around here. There's some of the things that are going on on this card that we want to draw your attention to. I know the prime timers have a bunch of events going up, the Reds game and lots of media, and I don't know if we've sold out of that yet, but if you uh, need some information on that, see Mabel, we're sold out. Okay, good, forget it, never mind. You're not allowed to go. That's right. But uh, there's all kinds of stuff that they're up to over the summer, so feel free to check that out. We got a mission trip coming up in July. We got VBS coming up in July. But one of the things we want to draw your attention to uh, this Friday, Friday, right, seventh, uh, we're having the block party here, right outside these doors. Uh, we're gonna have a bunch of fun. We have live music. We're gonna have a food truck, uh, and uh, just really some good time to have some fellowship. All right. Uh, we're going to talk about fellowship a little bit today, talk about what it is to, to be in community, to be a part of a community, and uh, we are kicking off a brand new series we call Life, the Games We Play, and uh, those are the th things that we kind of get trapped into, and one of the things we get trapped into is kind of isolating ourselves and doing life alone, and, and God, and there are moments for that, there are times for that, but God has called us all into community, and it's one of the blessings of gathering here together, and it's one of the, the points uh, of getting together for a meal. Now, these are uh, symbolic uh, emblems, right? They, they are elements that, that represent uh, a meal, uh, both that fills our physical uh, needs and also uh, fills our spiritual needs. And those physical needs are just a sustenance to have energy. And so the disciples would often share meals together. We'll talk about that here today. They're often breaking bread, if you will, or, or dining together because there's life that's shared in, in those moments. It's not just the physical sustenance, but there is meaningful conversation that is shared. Uh, things that you don't talk about on a normal basis, you might talk about over a, a, a dinner plate or a cup of coffee or across the table. And so that's the, the environment Jesus set when he gathered his disciples together and, and told them what was to come. And what was to come was his death and the kind of kingdom he was building. And he reminded them that if you want to be my disciple, you'll pick up your cross daily and, and follow my lead. And for most of us, that doesn't mean an actual death. It means living a sacrificial life surrendered to God. But for Jesus, and for some, it does mean an actual physical sacrifice. These emblems uh, remind us that Jesus went that far. Uh, it reminds us this, these elements are intended to put us in touch with reality. Uh, the real reality, the realm in which God operates, not a world that we're distracted by sinful habits and different things. It, re it reminds us of our identity, one, that he loved us so much that he was willing to die for us. He, he would rather die 
than live without us. And so that's what he did. And that these elements, the bread representing a broken body and the juice representing his shed blood, does that, reminds us of that. But uh, that, that in essence is the spiritual fulfillment that we are reminded of uh, or get to be reminded of each and every week. So let's remind ourselves, right? Together, if you would, take the cracker and we're reminded of just how much God loves us and our identity uh, as the beloved children of God. And secondly, the juice that represents the blood that flowed from that broken body that covers our sins forever. Pray with me. Lord, so grateful for these built-in reminders of your love for us. And that's where we can look to for our, our identity. As uh, a group of people that you love so much that you went so far to die. Not just to a death from old age or some natural cause, but an execution uh, that was brutal. And so, Lord, we're grateful for your sacrifice. We're grateful for how far you've gone to remind us of what we mean to you. And may that motivate us uh, to represent you and represent you well. We thank you for our church family where we can gather together for this meal and remind each other and encourage each other. But we thank you most of all for your son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. I'm a red. 
worship you And if it puts me in the fire Then I'll rejoice cause you're there too I won't be formed by feelings I'll hold fast to what is true And if the cross brings transformation I'll be crucified with you Cause death is just the doorway into rest loved ones been personally victimized by a sore winner or loser who always needs to be numero uno? If so, you may be entitled to free compensation from 3C. We're so sorry you have suffered, and we scrabbled up a plan to counsel those win-hungry hippos and keep you out of trouble. We know there is great risk for attitude problems with every game, but we believe this operation we have developed is a true monopoly and will benefit everyone in the end game. If you would like to learn more about this free compensation, climb on your battleship and get ready to fight for your spiritual and mental health during the 3C series called Life, the game we play. There is no monetary compensation for anyone involved in this program. This is just a fancy introduction to our next series. Sore winners and losers are encouraged to attend. When I say the word company, uh, what do you think of? Uh, probably most of us think of a business or for-profit organization. Uh, but when I say the word company today, I'm talking about having, there's a big difference between running a company and having company, right? You guys remember when you used to have company, right? The idea, when I was growing up, my mom would say, we're having company. Or the, the worst was uh, the idea that she would buy a treat or some kind of like coffee cake, you know, something scrumptious. And she would say, now, you kids, don't eat this. This is for company. Now, did we know who that company was? No, we didn't. It could have been any random person dropping by at any point. My mom had no idea who that coffee cake was actually for. It was just for random people stopping by who we would call company, right? We would have company. And if we went for that coffee cake, right, there'd be a broken digit or two or something like this. Or once I thought, you know, falsely, that I thought once company came, these random people that just showed up, right? No, no texting before, hey, are you home, right? No phone calls, nope. People just stopped by, rang the doorbell, knocked on the door, and they came in for a visit. It was crazy that we were having company. And then once they left and like half the coffee cake was left, I thought, oh, right, here we go. We can get some coffee cake now. Nope, that was, you know, still a few days of waiting because we might have more company come by, right? And it was torturous as a kid just having these random people stop by and this cake, this delicious treat was reserved for people. We had no idea who they were, but we were counting on coming, right? Now if somebody rings the doorbell, you're like hiding. You're like, <laughs> who is it, right? 
Um, no, we, you know, company used to be the thing. We have increasingly, as a culture, been more and more isolated. Today, we're, we're going to go through this series called A Life of the Games We Play. And it's really more about the lies we tell ourselves, the, 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 the games we play with ourselves and our lifestyle and how we operate. Today, our focus is on Uno, right? You ever played the game Uno? Right? Yeah. Any competitive game players in here? Okay. Some confession time, right? My daughter says, Dad, you're a sore loser, but you may be a worse winner. Because I let them know about it, right? It talks some smack. Uno has been uh, one of our family's longtime favorites. And if you don't know, it doesn't really matter. It's just kind of a play on game, uh, words for us. But it's this idea that you're trying to get rid of your cards. And when you get down to the last card, you have to exclaim Uno, right? Uh, to let everyone know they have the last chance to get rid of you before you can play your last card to get out. But we, we play this game not on a, a card game, but in our life. We have a tendency to want to drive more and more to isolation in general. And, and we as a, a community, as a church, are called to something bigger and better. And now, I love to play the game Uno, the card game Uno, but playing the game Uno in life where you drive and you get more and more alone is not a healthy place. It's not healthy to spend too much time alone. And I'm not saying there isn't time for that. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit too. But in the, our culture, the do whatever makes you happy culture, the, the culture that tells you to focus on you to, to do whatever uh, makes you happy, to love yourself, I just want to remind you that there is a balance to time alone, spending time alone. See, especially in, in this post-COVID digital era where the data is pretty clear at this point that there is too much time alone. There is such a thing as too much time alone. And it wasn't that long ago in, in 2020 where the world literally told you to socially distance yourself. I'm not trying to stir up any political things. I'm not trying to take a stand one way or another. Lord knows we have enough of that, right? Especially this week. And just as a reminder, we're here to be good news. Be good news to even people who are oppose you politically. In fact, Jesus calls you to do just those things sort of thing. So be good news online. Be good news to your political thing. Okay, ran over. But the idea here is that in a post-COVID culture, 2020, when they told us to isolate, to stay home and stay safe, to where we had all our interactions over Zoom or Google Meets or some kind of social media, uh, we, we have gotten more and more isolated, gravitated more and more lonely as a culture. Neighbor, neighbors went from having company, right, to, to building uh, more and more isolations. Uh, they would, builders used to put big front porches on houses. Now they put big back porches on houses. And you got a little bitty platform in the front. Why? Because we want our privacy. But the fences got higher and build bigger because we wanted privacy, right? We are on this privacy fence because we don't want any intrusion from neighbors. We, we built houses where garage doors opened automatically, where we could rise up, we drive right in and close the door so we don't have to risk any interaction with our neighbor. We, you walk uh, in your street or your neighborhood or wherever, you know, people don't want to make eye contact. They don't want to lift up and acknowledge your presence because they might have to say hello or something like that. You know, I remember when texting came around, and I remember thinking, why in the world would I go to all that effort, right? Now it's my primary mode of communication. Somebody calls you and go, what in the world are they calling for, you know? It's like we, we have grown more and more isolated in the technology, and just the state of our world has trained us to operate more and more to ourselves. And for many the, the goal is to operate on ourselves. We want to be alone. In fact, we will avoid people at all costs. And all I'm saying is that 
avoiding people at all costs comes at a big cost because it's not how we're wired to be. It's not how we're created to be. George Gallup, who's a Christian researcher, has said this recently, that Americans are the loneliest people in the world. There's recognized anthropologists and psychologists that have broken down our relationships in the United States, and they, they break it down into different stages. And the first stage is what they call intimates. This is just a group of two to five people that are supposed to know us really well, and we know them really well. There are people, and, and the statistics say that most Americans do not have five good friends, uh, people that know them and know them well, know their darks, dark sides and, and good sides. But we are, it's partly because we have been pursuing isolation. And whether, whether you've been hurt by someone and you're trying to avoid any further pain, whether you tend to be shy or introverted, just want to be left alone, maybe you've come out of a season that's distressful or you're busy and you just want some time alone to recover or you love God, but you know, you struggle with his people. Uh, these are all lies that you're telling yourself. You're, you're playing a game. Uh, and, and Uno, this game of isolation or individualism that we can do this on our own is a lie. And you know how I know it's a lie? It's because living life alone does not reflect the one whose image we bear. Now, that's a mouthful, but let me say it again. Living life alone does not reflect the one whose image we bear. In other words, living life alone is not how God created us, wired us, designed us to be. It's not how it's supposed to be. And the truth is we're all created in God's likeness. Oh, shoot. <laughs> just <laughs> flubbed here. But we're all created in God's likeness. We're not meant to do this life alone, that God himself is a community. And, and inside of God, there are three persons, the Father, the Son that we know as Jesus, and Holy Spirit. And, and when God made mankind, he, he uses the phrase that clarifies for us that there, he is making us in his image, but uh, in, in their image in the same way as three persons in one God. Genesis 1, 26 says this, let us make man in our image. So the very beginning, God is creative, but, but I want you to notice the us and the our. Let us, the community that is God, make man in our image. Father, Son, and Spirit in our image. It's a plural reference. Uh, uh, I point this out just to say this, that God exists in community. Father, Son, and Spirit created us in his image, so we are wired and designed for community just like God. Now, that's a theological uh, explanation, but also on a practical level, I have never known anyone who has been isolated, lonely, disconnected, and has no deep relationships like the statistics show that most people have, but also have a meaningful, joy-filled life. And that's because of this. By God's design, life is better together. By God's design, life is better together. Together. Now, again, let me state that there is nothing wrong with being alone at times. In fact, God calls us to spend time alone with just him, just like he calls us into community. And all of us naturally lean or favor one way or another. We lean towards naturally enjoying time alone, and others of us more lean into time with others. And and neither is wrong. We all are craving that. But most of us crave one and get energy from one and get drained by the other. 
This is often, these dispositions are often referred to introversion and extroversion. And what I want to clarify here as an introvert is, is someone who gets energy and fueled up by being alone. And it's not necessarily that they're even bad with people. They can be very good with people. It just drains them. An extrovert loves being with people, loves and gets energy and gets fueled out by being around people. Being alone drains them. I, I don't know where you fall on this scale, and there's some are an extreme extroverts, some are extreme introverts, but most of us fall a little bit in the center here, that, but lean one way or another. It's, it's important to know these things. I, I have many preacher friends who, who get to church on Sunday and love their Sunday experience, but afterwards, they have to go home and take a nap. Anybody else here like that? That you spend time with your friends, you love your friends, you love being with your friends, but it drains you, right? And, and you need to recharge by being alone. My son is notorious, my oldest son is notorious, who's an introvert, for sneaking off in the middle of parties to go take a nap, right? To go to his room and just veg out. We like in the middle of a Christmas celebration, we'll be like, where's Anthony? And we're like, oh, he's introverting somewhere, right? This sort of thing. Where his parents are like, hey, more people, you know, it's like, yeah, Anthony's having to recharge somewhere else. There is no right or wrong here. There's no good or bad. It's just a matter of where you get your energy. And if you're an extrovert, you prefer uh, to be around people because that's where you get filled up. But here, let me say this, though. No matter what disposition you hold, whether you tend to like being alone and get filled up or like being around others, God all wants to, to experience both time alone with him and community with others. There's a balance. And God calls introverts into community with others, and he calls extroverts into solitude with him. And so I'm not trying to say that there's anything sinful about being alone. This is about, you know, it's about where you're getting energy, the, the introvert, extrovert. But there is a point at which culture shifts us to be more and more isolated that we do not experience the community that God has called us to, a healthy community. I think of it in terms of introversion and extroversion in terms of a meal, a balanced meal, right? Where if you're an extrovert, your main course, your steak, right, is people. If you're an extrovert, your main dish is people. But it's good to have vegetables on the side or a potato with it with all the fixings, you know, whatever it might be. But the idea here is that time alone for me is a discipline. Time alone with God to me is harder than being with people. I'm more communal. I'm more extroverted. Some of you might be flipped where your main dish is being alone. And your steak part of the dinner is being alone. But don't forget the sides. It's about balancing it out and that God has called us no matter where you are to stretch you if you're an introvert into community and, and, and an introvert into or introvert into community extrovert into isolation solitude but I want to point out this that we are called to do both and, and we are called to live the majority of our life of our life with others with others. And here's part of what I know about this. And we're going to show a few of the scriptures in the Bible here. We're just going to scroll through them. And there are over a hundred one another statements that you're called to do this to one another, to love one another, to forgive one another, to honor one another, to serve one another, to bear one another's burdens. I don't, I'm not going to read them all. I'm not talking about them all. There is scripture after scripture where it commands you to do something to one another, right? And they just keep rolling through scripture. You know what you can't do to one another is be alone and do it to another. You can't be alone and love someone else. You can't be alone and honor someone else. You can't be alone and forgive someone else. 
You cannot be alone in your faith. You are wired to do life together. You are wired to live your faith out together. And so there is some, there is too much alone time. Being a Christian and saying, hey, you know, and there are those people that try to say, hey, I'm just living out my faith on my own. And there's like other people say, hey, don't push your faith. And we shouldn't push our faith on people. But at the same time, we should be talking as if faith is our life, that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. And we should not be ashamed to talk like that. But the idea that we would that we would not be doing something uh, to someone else is just not Christian, not loving someone that requires us to do that. But some people want to say, hey, I'm just doing my faith thing on my own. I don't want to do it with a church, right? And I get some people have been burnt. Some people have been hurt. But that's part of it. We are, I am going to hurt your feelings. If you're a cat person, I've likely already hurt your feelings. (laughs) But we are going to hurt one another. But we are called to ask for forgiveness. I'm sorry, you cat people. I'm sorry. But we're also to grant forgiveness. We're also to carry one another's burdens. To love one another. Serve one another. To not backstab each other. All these one another's. But you can't do it alone. Trying to be a Christian and doing it alone is like saying, I'm an NFL player, but I'm not on a team. Now, that's nice. You, you may be really skilled at football. You may have all the abilities to be a football. You may have once even used to play for a football team, but you cannot be an NFL player. If you're not on a team, think about all the recovery groups that we see, AA and NA, and and celebrate recovery in any kind of 12-step program. Incidentally, if you've never gone and read the 12 steps, those are good modes of operation for any Christian. It's about forgiving people. It's about acknowledging your limitations. It's about acknowledging God. It's all these different things. You should read through them. But there's a reason those organizations are successful because they acknowledge that you need a team, a support group to get healthy, to grow, to to be better. And you cannot do it on your own. You're likely not going to grow on your own, and you're likely not going to be Christ-like on your own. This is true for recovery groups. It is true in faith groups because God has wired this life and us like that. And it's by God's design that life is better together. You are better together with other people. Dr. Henry Cloud A clinical psychologist says this, the research illustrates that when we are in loving relationships, we are growing. When we are isolated, we are dying. When I talk about community here at 3C, I'm talking about your people. I'm talking about a spiritual family, an extended spiritual family. This, I am not including, and let me say this clearly, and this might be a little controversial, I am not including your biological family. The who in your life is your spiritual family that is above and beyond your biological or adopted family. These are the people I'm referring to. Yes, your, your natural family, your nucleus family can be a part of that, but it's about beyond that as a community of believers. Jesus get real controversial. He'd stay up and say, no, you are my mother and brother. And some didn't like hearing that. But if you don't have a group or community of followers of Jesus that you identify as your people, as your spiritual family, as people that you turn to when times get tough, uh, uh, people who, when times their times get tough, turn to you, the people who know you and you know them, that you have history with, 
that you, you've done life with, you get together with on a regular basis. This is spiritual community I'm talking about. This is the spiritual extended family that I'm referring to. And if you're not experiencing that community God has called you to, you're not living the life he has called you to. The best way I can think to convey that is to look at what I think is the, the best example of this kind of community. We find it in the first century, right after Jesus lives his life, dies his death, raises from the dead, and ascends. We find the church in its early stages and his followers begin practicing what he's taught them to practice. And listen what it says here in Acts 2, 42. And if you've heard this scripture a million times, try to read it again with fresh eyes on just how they were doing life together. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need, and every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread. This is the second time broke bread has come up. You know why we talk about eating together and share meals together around here? It's because it's a practice of the early church, and it's what community of believers looks like. You do. You eat together. You dine together. You enjoy each other. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. I love that phrase, the f enjoying the favor of all the people. You know why? Because they were good news, and they were spreading the good news and being good news. And the Lord added to their number daily those that were being saved. That's what community looks like. That's a spiritual family. That's authentic community. That's a communal experience. I don't care if you're extroverted or introverted that they were all a part of. You had people like my son who probably bowed out a little early and take naps on these little get-togethers. But the truth is they experienced this together. Let me just remind you of what they were devoted to. One, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were learning and growing and being challenged by what it meant to look like someone who loved the people and, and lived like Christ. And, and growing usually requires growing pains, right? Growing pains are not always comfortable. I have a good friend who's fairly diminutive in his stature, and he said, I never experienced growing pains. He said, that's because you had growing irritations. That's all right. <laughs> but when you're growing physically, or you're growing emotionally, you're growing spiritually, you're going to be stretched outside your comfort zone, and it's gonna, you're going to feel it. That's what they were doing when they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship. This is that friendship, but kind of a, a summary word of everything they were, were doing, but they were adhering to that one another list that we talked about earlier. That's what fellowship looks like. They were deepening friendships. They were experiencing new friendships as the Lord added to their number and they gained the favor of all the people. Three, they were breaking bread. They were dining together because they saw what Jesus did and he just did ministry across the table because lots of good stuff happens when you share a meal with someone. Lots of good things. Meaningful conversations. Laughter. Nothing quite bonds people together like a good laugh, unless you're serving together. And that's what happens at the table, too. People serve one another. They love one another. This is why this little meal, those symbolic, is important when we get together. And the last thing is, 
I don't know if you've ever heard this before. Prayer. If you've been hanging around the last several weeks, there's been intentional pull, pushing down the lever on prayer. Because prayer, as I, when I said when we did communion, reminds us of reality, of our identity in God, who we are, and what we're called to do. It connects us with the God that's on another realm, another dimension. And that's reality in us. For us, it reminds us and connects us to that reality. And my, my point in bringing all this up is if you're not experiencing these four things in your community, then you're missing out on what God has called you to. That this is part of the experience that you're not meant to do life on your own outside of these things, that you can kind of do life, and this is the kind of lies we tell us, that we can do our faith on our own. We don't need to be in a community. We don't need other people. We can do it on our own. We can pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, and it's simply not true. You're limited in your abilities. You're limited in your knowledge. You're limited in all these ways, but my point is, if you're not experiencing this kind of community, th then you're missing out on the life God has designed for you. If you're not experiencing this kind of community that God has designed for you, if you're missing out on this, you're not following Jesus. You're, you're not following his ways. You're not listening or obeying his teachings. And, and flat out, you cannot be like Jesus if you're not following his ways. And one of the key things he modeled for us is being in an authentic spiritual community. Outside of that, as a Christian, you're lying to yourself. You're playing games with yourself because by God's design, he designed life to be better together. Having company for this life is exactly how God designed it. He designed it for our journey in life and for our faith. And so my question to you is, how can you step out of a quarantine mindset, an isolation mindset, and into community, the kind of community we see in Acts 2? How can you step out of your comfort zone more than likely, and step into community? How can you step out of the Sunday morning crowd, right? Th this is great. This is meaningful. This is described environment in, in Acts. But the truth is, community is not staring at the back of people's heads. Listen to some ugly dude on stage. It's sitting around a circle or around a table, looking into each other's eyes, talking about God and life. At 3C, we try to help people find and connect in community. Honestly, we love nurturing organic community where, where friends are getting together, but they're, they're practicing learning from the apostles' teaching, prayer for each other, devoted to one another in fellowship and, and breaking bread. That's great. We love just nurturing and fostering that, but we also want to take people that are, find it difficult to form that and kind of help you find a group that you can connect to. You can take one of these cards and just, if you're interested and you're not plugged into a community or Bible study that you just are connected to with your people, if you're not in one of those, I just encourage you to write your name and contact information if you don't have it and just uno with a line through it. Just, just say, I want to step out of my individualism my isolation and, and practice the things that Jesus taught us to practice that he modeled for us. One of our values here at 3C, and this all is kind of an overlap, but one of it is pivotal relationships. And, and those pivotal relationships usually aren't nurtured in a crowd, but a community. And so let me encourage you to not play the game of Uno, not the card game, but the game of life, where you do it on your own. And 
step out of isolation and into community. If you want help with that, fill this, drop it in the box on the way out. But I want to challenge all of us to be nurturing this kind of community in our life because it's where we grow and it's where we look like Jesus. There is power in we, them, and they. I could tell story after story about some of the beautiful things that groups have done. And it's usually when people come to Christ, when people end up in this tub, it's usually not because one person did it, it's because they saw several people living that life and go, maybe there's something up to that Jesus. And so let me encourage you to live life in community, not in isolation, not as an individual that could do it on their own, but in a group setting, knowing that God has called us, God modeled us this for us. And if nothing else, I want to be more and more like him. Let's pray. God, uh, thank you for giving us people. Lord, we're just grateful for your presence. We're grateful for the presence of your Holy Spirit in us. But we're grateful that you instructed us to have a tangible kingdom, your kingdom, with people that we can uh, cry on their shoulder, put her arm around, to, to mess with, to get around with, and joke with, and laugh with. But God, uh, more than anything, that we support one another as we try to be good news where we live, work, and play. When we get together, we try to break the sinful habits that the world tries to teach us to do where we just are encouraged by one another, but also challenged by one another. And so God, if there's anybody in this room that isn't experiencing that kind of community, I just pray that they'll step out of their comfort zone and into that environment. And so God, thank you for making sure that we're not alone in this journey. Not only are you have you promised to be with us, but you've given us others to walk lockstep with. Thank you for that gift, Lord. We sing your praises in Jesus' name.
Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Have a great week, everybody.